Amen. Well, it's such a pr privilege for me to be here. Uh, Connie, thank you for having me, bring the gospel of Jesus on this platform and uh, to the people that your ministry reaches. Uh, Philem, thank you for that message. So powerful to hear that we can speak to people from what God has done, you know, reaching, speaking to the world from the perspective of the resurrected Christ, the perspective of of the kingdom of God, calling them into the reality of God. And that is so powerful. It's absolutely life-changing. Um, now, today I would like to talk a little bit about, I don't know exactly how to word the title of this, but making what God has done real. Having it in this world. Having it practical, that it means something for us in this world and I think when we look at what Jesus Christ has done when we look at the resurrection we look at the whole what we would call the born again experience the life that God has given us traditionally we have focused a lot of that to the inner man uh, to the spirit of man to who I am inside my body and not so much towards uh, God saving humans you know, God saving the earth, God bringing life to the earth. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, let us pray together. Father, I want to thank you that I can be here this morning. Thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for the wonderful truth that we can hear you speak to us from the finished work of Christ, the resurrected Christ, calling us to the revelation and the truth of what you say about us, of what is true in Jesus. I thank you, Father, that today as I preach this message, that you just empower me, because by my own ability I can do nothing. But by you, I can speak and I can minister by the Spirit of life to have a message that resonate with what you already have been speaking to people, even from conception. And I thank you, Lord, that that can be so today. Speak through me, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, yeah, it's a great blessing to think of the empty grave, to think of Jesus Christ that was raised from the dead and to interpret scripture from that perspective. If we think of the Apostle Paul, we think of a man that was a zealot. Now, a zealot was somebody that was very zealous for the traditions of their fathers. When Paul lived in his time, uh, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was somebody that was really passionate about keeping the law for the purpose of ushering in the rule of the Messiah. That is what it was all about. They believed that if they lived right, if they live according to the law, it would be an invitation for the kingdom of God. It would be an invitation for the Messiah. And they knew what Messiah would mean to them as Jews. Messiah to them as Jews would mean freedom from exile. And they still believed, although they were not in Babylonian exile anymore, and that ended about 400 years before the time of Jesus, they still believed that they were not completely free. They still believed that they could not exercise their rights as the people of God the way they wanted. They could not worship God the way they wanted to worship God. And they were under the oppression of the Romans. They were under what we would call political oppression and they waited for a messiah that could be real they waited for a messiah that could set them free they waited for a messiah that could break the yoke of rome off their backs that is what they were looking for and the way the um, i mean there were the sadducees and the pharisees and the sadducees were basically a group that were living close up with the roman people and they were living kind of the life of the wealthy. Uh, and they and Rome worked together. But when we look 
Look at the Pharisees. The Pharisees, maybe they were not such prosperous people, although obviously some of them were rich and so forth. But they were seeking to follow the law to the letter so that the Messiah can come. Now, imagine now uh, somebody saying that there was a man, uh, his name was Jesus, and he lived on the earth for a while, and then he was caught by Rome and disowned by some Jews because he was breaking laws and he wanted to break down the temple in three days. You know, he said, well, he says, break down this temple in three days, I'll rebuild it. And he said things that was not supposed to be said. He didn't live a pure life. He was somebody that hanged out with prostitutes and sinners and so forth. He could not truly have been a prophet. And then he died. And now a lie is going around that this man was raised from the dead. And now people start to follow him. And as people start to follow him, we find even that this message is now bordering towards Gentiles calling themselves Jews. And that's absolute blasphemy. That is absolute against what God wants. And now we find this uh, guy, uh, or we find the, the people, Peter and them, going preaching around that this man is the Messiah. God knows that Messiah will never arrive if we have this heresy preached. We should stop this message. We should stop this message of a resurrection because we all know that the dead don't rise the way they said. And we all know that that man was killed by Rome. So how could he be the Messiah? How can he bring freedom for us? Because we need political freedom. We need it, and we desperately need it, and we need to stick to the law. We need to stick to what is right. We need to stick to righteousness. We need to stick to what is good. And then we will find that God will deliver Israel from Rome, and we would be able to be the people of God in this world. And Paul, as a zealot, was thinking of somebody called Phineas. And Phineas... Uh, you know, he was really standing for righteousness amongst the people. And what he would say is, and what he did was, there, were, there was in Israel a man that took a, a, a Gentile woman and he went into his tent and slept with her. And he thought, I want to eradicate sin out of the camp. I want the blessings of God. And he took a spear and killed both of them while they were intimate. And then the scripture says that what he has done was accounted to him for righteousness forevermore. And we could think of a guy like Paul, called Saul, thinking, I'm going to have righteousness, the righteousness that Phineas had, the righteousness of eradicating sin and being a savior for my people. And the way we're going to do it is through the law. We're going to keep to the law until our Messiah arrives. And Paul was going and he was on a spree of getting Christians, men and women and children, everybody uh, jailed and some of them died. He was standing at the stoning of Stephen, trying to see that righteousness can come to this world, that life can come to this world, that the Jews can be who they're supposed to be. And then we find that as he was going to stop this lie of this guy that they said was raised from the dead, on the way to Damascus, the very one that he said was dead appeared to him. <laughs> and that's when he had a change of doctrine. <laughs> you know, he had to say, well, something is wrong here. I'm seeing something wrong. And obviously, Paul, when he was... Uh, on his way, you know, he was, and during maybe a time of prayer, he was thinking of Ezekiel, he was thinking of the vision of the throne with the, someone on the throne like the Son of Man. The Jews were praying and they were thinking, meditating upon that. And most probably he must have been thinking of that. And all of a sudden, boom, here appears Jesus. Physical appearance. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he knows he was persecuting these people, you know, the physical people on the earth. He was not persecuting Jesus. Man, Jesus, who you say you are, don't even exist in my mind. 
That's what Paul would have said. But here we find something practical, real happening in this world. Jesus appears in physical form. The man Jesus that was born out of Mary, that was carried by Mary, is still alive and can never die. And he's seated at the right hand of God. And he appears to Paul. And all of a sudden, Paul had to look at all of Scripture through the lens of the resurrected Jesus. And that became his hermeneutic. He could not look at Scripture anymore, but through the resurrected Jesus. And he had to come to the conclusion that God didn't come to save the Jews from Rome, but that he come to save Jews and Gentiles as well as creation from death. That changes everything. That changes everything. That makes what God has come to bring into this world different than what we just traditionally thought. You know, I was thinking many times, I think in the old South Africa, uh, for instance, we would say, you know, God is going to save us from the communist. You know, or God is going to save us from a certain political group or pressure group and so forth. But the reality is that God has come to remove death. Death for that political group and death from us to bring life to all of us. That is what he's come to do. And if we can realize that the power of God's life in the man Jesus and the rule of life that God has brought to this earth is so great that no death can keep it down. And we are part of His body. You will find love born in your heart towards people that are against your views. You will not be threatened by their views. This morning I was speaking to Rick and, um, you know, we were talking about this message of the resurrection and where it will end up. What is the purpose of even preaching this other than just understanding the gospel? At the end of the day, the message of the resurrection or clarity as pertaining to doctrine and so forth, to me, is not just to understand, but it's to have the life that can be born from that understanding. You know, where uh, imagine that you are not so, you are so little threatened with maybe a radical uh, leftist point of view, strict communist point of view. You're, so, you're not threatened by that to the point that you say to that person, listen man, I've got a, a house somewhere. Do, do you want to go on holiday somewhere? I'll, I, I want to spend time with you. I want to be good to you. I want to love you. Is there something that I can do for your kids? You know, well, so I cannot do that because, uh, well, you know, you can if you're born from God. If you're not born from God, you can't. Because we find the eternal, immortal God do things for people that hated him. He prayed and died and was raised for the very soldiers that crucified him. So when we talk about the power of the resurrection, and I've had many times, uh, you know, when we really talk about the power of the resurrection, it's much more than just not stressing if your car is maybe running out of fuel. (laughs) It's much more than the little things that kind of doesn't bring comfort to us. It's about having the knowledge of an endless life where you feel not just in your spirit but physically that I can live forever and never die. When you know that and even faces death and you say, well, this is just like I said yesterday, a halfway house, I can be raised from the dead. And I can continue to live and will continue to live with God forever. And nothing can take life from me. And nothing can give life to me. You'll be like Jesus. Where Jesus, the Bible says in John 13, he says, And Jesus, knowing that the Father has given all things into his hand, and that he comes from the Father and goes unto the Father, what that basically means is is that who he is comes from God, and he is on his way to the fullness of the life of God bodily, which is to have eternal life bodily, 
Once you realize that, what he did was he took off his own garments. He unclothed himself and clothed, he took his outer garments off and clothed himself with a towel and served others. This is what the message of the resurrection will bring in us. And that is what I'm looking for, to be honest with you. You know, uh, it might look as if it is not so comforting. It, it might not fit our culture perfectly because uh, the gospel is not the message of how we can reach our cultural goals by the power of God. It is about sharing in the life of God. And if you want to look at what the life of God looks like in this world, why the, while this world is still a broken world, a world that it, where we have not seen perfection, if you want to see what it looks like, you're going to have to look at Jesus when he walked the earth. What did he do? He knew I am the son of God. He knew eternal life is promised to me. What did he do? He served. Why? Because he knows the father serves me with eternal life and can never be taken from me. Where you can take, uh, where you can welcome those who would by the tradition of the day be the enemy of God. Which would be who today, according to our system, according to our political systems? Who would be the enemy? That's the one to whom our house will be open. Now, it's a very radical message. But we want to talk about practicality of the resurrection. If you know that you have eternal life and, and this is what I'm going to talk about, if you know that your eternal life is not just a spiritual thing, which is directed to your spirit, but that the born-again experience is something greater than just the spirit, but it is the recreation of the complete human, where you, spirit, soul, and body, is completely safe in the presence of God. Now, I remember, um, I'm going to say one thing that can maybe be a bit shocking to keep your attention, and then I'll explain it. I looked for the scripture that talks about the born-again spirit because I wanted to one day make a message about, uh, you know, the born-again spirit. And, you know, the typical spirit, soul and body, and I was thinking, let me preach on this. And then I went and I searched for where it says our spirits are born again. And I couldn't find one verse. If you have a verse, show me. But that is, our whole doctrine is built on that. But I do find a verse where it says that the human can be born again. And that would include spirit, soul, and body. That is quite clear, you know. And, and uh, I mean, uh, what we've had and what I had was this. Uh, my spirit is born again, and I'm okay with God. But the reality of life is I'm not living in a spirit world. I'm living on earth. Right here. I don't know if you've noticed. And there are some issues in this world. Our difficulties in this world. Our problems are in this world. The people that we find issue with is in this world, of this world. Do you know that most of the fights in this world is about property? Yes. Land. It's about health care. Practical things. That's where our issues are. We've got this wonderful born-again spirit experience and we talk about it on a Sunday, but I tell you, we've got real life. We've got real life. We've got this world, man. And we need to sort out this world. And if this guy can change and this guy can be in power and that guy cannot be and this law should be there and that one should be changed, if those things can just take place, we can have peace in this world. How, where does the Prince of Peace come in? Where does what Jesus has done come in? Well, the way we're going to get what Jesus has done coming to this world is we're going to force by legislation people that don't believe in God to live like the people of God. And then they're going to, you know, then we're going to have some peace in this earth. And how much peace do you have if you force your teenager? <laughs> you know? 
You know what? You're going to wash the dishes, then you wash the car, then you mow the lawn, then you're going to do this and whatever. Let me tell you something. Maybe if you force them and put enough fear, they will do it. But you're not having joy in that house. You don't have enjoy in that house. And the moment they come to the point where they're not fearing you anymore, you're in trouble and turmoil in that house. And that is not the way it works in this world. And I think what has happened is we as Christians, we've looked at the born-again experience, we've looked at what God has come to give us, and we've only seen the safety of it as what happens to my spirit when I believe and where I go when I die. Instead of seeing the kingdom of God entering into this world and God taking what is eternal, immortal, who is who God is and forming and shaping it into the matter of this earth and so he's continuing to do that in this world and he will do it to the point that the fullness of God is manifested in this earth by the Holy Spirit. That's the only answer. And there's no other way. Now, when we look at, I mean, when I look at this, I mean, I live in South Africa. South Africa, we have, uh, I mean, if I look at the political situation in, in America, for instance, you guys are still just busy with Sunday school. You're not really busy with church, you know. We've got real issues. You don't have problems here. Okay? This is nothing. I've been to Zimbabwe before. I've been to a place where they don't even have their own currency. And do you know what? The Christians there, very happy. Very, very happy. As a matter of fact, like I said to Pastor Gregory, uh, here am I coming from a country that doesn't even have electricity every day for six to eight hours every day. They have these... Uh, uh, blackouts, you know, where they cut the power, uh, they will switch off half of a major city's electricity. Now imagine the traffic and all those kind of things. And here am I, sent by God to bring you good news. <laughs> Very happy. Why? Because the life that I have in this world is born from someone that was born into this world, conquered the death of of this world and lives forever bodily and the spirit of that life has been poured out on my flesh and I can see that that spirit is working in this world bringing the rulership of God into this world and I don't have to fear. Yes. I don't have to fear because nothing can stop this. It is unstoppable. In order for eternal life and the fullness of God to stop in this world, you will have to reverse the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like Donald Trump said, the, is it the missile man in North Korea? He cannot stop the work of Christ. Putin cannot stop the work of Christ. Neither Trump or Biden can stop the work of Christ. Or Cyril Ramaphosa in South Africa can stop the work of Christ. And the work of Christ is not in any other place but here. And that we need to understand. And that is what the prayer was that Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6. He says, Our Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now again, as I said last night, I'm not saying there's not a halfway house on the way to Tulsa, you know. I'm not saying there's not a, a, rest, a rest place. There is a rest place, but I want to tell you God's vision is not to get the rest place like heaven. God's vision is to bring heaven to earth. And the way we'll find heaven on earth is by this. Jesus was raised from the dead. Those who believe upon him, he will find that his spirit starts to permeate their flesh. Doesn't the Bible say the spirit was poured out on flesh? Yeah. 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 Why would spirit be poured out on flesh? Because the problem is people are dying. 
We haven't seen the problem in Christianity. What is the problem that there is with people in the world? Look at the whole picture. God creates the earth, then he makes a little mud man there, put life in him. Hey, hi. You know, I'm God. I want to say something good to you. You see, you've, I've made you from the dust of the earth. I want to just tell you your name quickly. You are Adam. Adam, I just want to say this, the, the name for earth is Adama. So you are Adam. So you are made of this dust. So Adam, by yourself, you can only return to dust. But I want to show you something. Come walk with me. You see this tree of life? I'm giving you access to this. You can eat of this and live forever and never die. Wow. And as Adam is on his way to this tree of life, a snake comes and tells him, why would you want to eat of that tree? You're okay. Don't trust God. Just stand by your own power. And then something happens. God's mud man that was destined and what God was creating, walking with him, bringing forth eternal life for this man, died. Now that's a serious problem. That's a serious problem. God's man died. Death entered into this world. So what would the solution be? The solution would be to end death in the world. How do you end death in the world? God came and went to Mary. And from Mary, from the dust of the earth, he created an Adam, a man. And he said to this man, when he was growing up, he was reading the scriptures, he says, Jesus, I want to tell you something. There's a tree of life that you can eat from. Just believe me. They will kill you. But I want to tell you, I will raise you up and I will establish you in this earth as my son that can never die. And we will together solve the problem of what happened to this earth and its people. And we will bring life to this earth. That's what we will do. And what did Jesus do? He simply trusted the Father. When they nailed him to the cross, he didn't try to take himself off the cross. He said, my Father has promised. That's what he basically said. Then he died and the Father raised him from the dead. And we find this man that was born from Mary, after he died, he was begotten of God. And it's like as if he was born again. He was born and then he was born again. But this birth was a birth from the Spirit directed to his body wherein he had the surety of eternal life forever. Now, Jesus Christ came in John chapter 3 and he said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you know what? You need to be born again. I believe, and this is my opinion, it was not just directed to his Spirit, but it was directed to the complete human, where he said to him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus understood exactly what he said. That's why he was a bit confused. Because today, if I come to you and say, you must be born again, and it's directed just to your spirit, you will say, no problem. In the ancient Jewish times, there was a concept of being born again, which was a washing that you would go through, and you will kind of be a new person. But when Jesus, when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus and he said to him, you must be born again, the words that was used uh, that he spoke to Nicodemus was of such a sort that Nicodemus heard what Jesus said and he was confused. He said, well, I hear what you're saying, but I don't know how it's possible. 
Because how can a man enter his mother's womb and be reborn? Do you want to tell me this body of mine, the whole of me, must be reborn, recreated, to be under the rule of life, or I, I use my own words now, to be under a rule there or a new creation bodily? How can my body be recreated? It's impossible. How can I enter my mother's womb and be reborn? Jesus says, don't be amazed. He didn't say, Nicodemus, you're not understanding what I'm saying. He says, don't be amazed that I'm saying this to you. Now today, I can stand up in a church and say, listen, you must be born again bodily. And people say, no, how can that be? Exactly the same reaction as Nicodemus. Because what Jesus was saying is that you, as a human being, are under the rule of death. But you can be completely, physically, spirit, soul, and body under the rule of life. And if we can see this new birth as I as a human am born now from the power of God, from the spirit of God, to the point that every part of me is included, we will not be so touched by what's going on around us. Because we will know it's not my... Because this is the thing that I've had. It was almost like my spirit was in communication with my body where my spirit would say... I would, I would sometimes say to my body, to the flesh, Oh, flesh man, I'm just using simple words now. You know, why are you so in fear? And then the body would kind of say to the spirit, Well, it's easy for you to speak. <laughs> You're holy... You righteous, you're accepted by God and everything. And I'm dying out here. I'm hungry, I'm hot, I'm cold, I need clothes. And I'm living in a world where people don't even care about me. They don't even care about, I mean, there's racism in this world, hello. Yes. You know? Hello. It's like spirit, it's good for you. You're heading to the halfway house. I'm heading to the grave. Come on. But when I started to study that, I'm, I thank God so much that I went for that study looking at uh, the born again spirit. Then I started to read that and I started to realize that the new birth is to the whole human. And you know what my flesh found? Rest. <laughs> all of a sudden the whole of me feels peace if I live in a nice house or one that's not so nice have you seen the car I drove the, the size of the car I drove here I think there's only one smaller car <laughs> is yours smaller than that You know, I am not what I drive. I find glory. I mean, you get in Tony's car. It's like a driving concert hall, you know, compared to the car that I drive. And it doesn't matter what I drive. Wherever I go, there I am. I am born of God and every part of me. Hallelujah. One might say, and this is the thing that people might have using this, just the, the, the uh, 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 metaphor of birth. One might say, but I don't see you fully born of God. You still have a mortal body. It is, it, it is equivalent to a baby that's in the womb. A baby that's in the womb maybe is not seen. But we are not saying the baby is not there. Formed by God. The conception has taken place. It's formed and shaped. And who I am. Spirit, soul and body is being born into this world. As my final destination. As where I will forever live and be with God. So Jesus comes to Nicodemus and says, Nicodemus. I want to tell you something. You need to be born again. Jesus 
What are you saying? How can I enter my mother's womb? Listen, Nicodemus, you, the one that you think must enter into the mother's womb, the physical you, can be born of the Spirit. Meaning, the Holy Spirit can give birth to a new form of physicality. Like Jesus. The Bible says, and let's go to Romans quickly. Romans chapter, how long have I preached? Ten minutes left. Um, Romans 10. Excuse me, Romans 1. Just Paul, 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, those of you that listened, maybe I shouldn't ask this, maybe you forgot what I preached. But um, the gospel of God is the good news of the kingdom of God that has entered this material, physical world. He's set apart for the gospel of God. Paul says in another place, he says that remember Jesus, born of the seed of David, risen from the dead, this is my gospel. The gospel that Paul preached was the resurrection. So he says, I'm set apart for the good news of God that Jesus was bodily raised from the dead and that life has now come to this earth. That is what he's saying. It says, which he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So he promised eternal life. Concerning his son, who was a descendant from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. So, Jesus was called, he was born of a woman, but he was declared the son of God bodily in being raised from the dead. So Jesus had a body that was born from Mary, but that very same body, after it died, when it was raised from the dead, owed its birth from the dead, not to Mary, but to the Spirit of God that was taking human flesh and making it unable to die, to live forever as a human being. That's what you call a body born from the Spirit. Now, he says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you can be born of the Holy Spirit. What he's simply saying to him is, listen, you can be, you, your body can become like, it can carry the full glory of God as what Jesus' body carried in the resurrection. It can happen. Now, we don't see that happen to any one of us although it is a hope that we have. But the Spirit that will do that is already poured out in us. And that is from where we live with hope. So we, me, if I see our uh, government go and they switch off the electricity, and some years ago they said, we, have, we want to change the Constitution to bring the following law. We want to have something that's called the expropriation of land without compensation. Do you know what that means? They take your stuff and don't pay you. You know when that happened? I didn't feel this fear. Because that land doesn't keep me alive. And that land cannot give me what I truly want. And what I truly want, the spirit of it, the life of it, is already on me. I, when I pray in tongues, it says, Jesus was raised from the dead. And what it says to my flesh, it says to my flesh, you have the surety of eternal life. So when they say to me, you they, we're taking your property, we're taking your land, you're not going to have it, and we're not going to pay for it. And we, we, we find people of political parties singing songs saying, we need to kill the white man. You know what I feel? Nothing. I feel nothing. Because my flesh has heard the message of life. 
my gospel, the gospel that I've read in the scriptures, the gospel that I've interpreted through the lens of the resurrection of Jesus and what that rule in the earth means has given me the first fruit of a new birth where even my body, my thoughts, my brain, the neuropaths in my brain, everything, start to be shaped and formed by the Spirit that can give this body eternal life. And it changes the way I think. It changes the way I reason. It changes the way my wife and I talk about our children and our future. It's all of a sudden as if the darkness of this world is seen. Yes, we see it. Yes, we acknowledge it. But we're not living from it. We're not living from it. It's something real. Because I have received the spirit of new birth. The Bible says this outstanding thing, and, and, and let me first answer this, then I'll go to one, uh, John chapter 1 verse 12 in the next four minutes. Nicodemus says, how is it possible that I can be born again? How can my body be born of the Spirit? He says, this is it. As I, as the snake was lifted up in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that whosoever believes in Him, listen to the words, will not perish, but have everlasting life. Does it make sense? Because you can see the context here is, how can I enter into my mother's womb? I don't understand how this new birth takes place. Well, this is it. If I be lifted up, Jesus was lifted up in two ways. He was lifted up on the cross, he died, and then he was lifted up in the glorification and in the, in the resurrection and in the ascension. So when we behold the snake on the pole, meaning the crucifixion or the death of death, when we behold the death of death in the resurrection of Jesus and we believe upon that, we receive life, not just for the Spirit, but that life is directed and aimed to the physical human being. That's how you become born again. What happened to the people when the snakes bit them? They were physically dying. Then they saw the snake on the pole which would be the crucifixion of death, the ending of death, which would, uh, which would be the same as the resurrection of Jesus. When they saw the end of death, the Bible says, and they simply looked at this with an expectation from it. They were born again. They didn't die anymore. They continued to live. Can you see that new birth? Can you see that analogy? The analogy was, people were bitten by snakes, they sinned, and now they are dying. Now, you see the crucifixion of the snake, the end of death, and all of a sudden, the poison doesn't work in their bodies anymore, and they can now live. How can I be born again? Through seeing the glorified Christ and the end of death in this world and how God has brought life to this world. So that we can go to people that are, the Bible says, in all, all their life been in the bondage through the fear of death. That we can go to them and say to them, look at Jesus. What did Jesus do? Jesus was facing the cross and with vehement cries, he cried out, the Bible says, to the Father who is able to save him. And then the scripture says, who did save him from death and raised him from the dead. And now we can preach salvation. Which is what? Being saved from the death in this world, not as a theory or as something that we think, of, think about as in, in some form of thought experiment, but where we think of it in the practicality and the reality of the Messiah that has come to this earth, not to save us from this world, but to save this world, nature and people from sin and death and bring the kingdom of God to this world. And can God do it? Well, let me explain how. And you'll remember this. Imagine you say to God, God, I know that you are Almighty God and you can do kind of anything. But can you maybe demonstrate what you can do with my sin 
and with my death? Then he will say, okay, let me take a man and I'll put your life and all of the death that you have in him. Then you can stand and simply look at what it would look like in your case if you simply believe upon me. And Jesus didn't only take me and my sin, but he took the sin of the whole world, the death that everyone dies, the sin that everyone is in, the curse that everyone has, and put it in one man at one place. And then that man, Jesus, which is now basically us, we talk about a substitution there, when we look at that, what did he do to change the death in him? Nothing. He just believed the Father. So the Father is saying, let me show you how it looks. I'll take you and I will demonstrate your cursed life in another body so that you can see. This man does nothing. He just believes me. But God, what if the worst happened? What, what if I believe that you've come to give me eternal life and I die? Well, let me show you. Jesus believes and what happens? He dies. And the Father shows his faithfulness and raises Jesus from the dead so that we can have peace in the new birth. And then he says, John 1.12, to each one that believes is given the authority to be born of God. These are those who are not born of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but a person can then be born of the Father. I want to tell you, your body can be born of God. How can it be? Look at Jesus. Jesus was born of Mary and he had to be saved from death. Well, no, Jesus didn't have to be saved from death. Well, Hebrews chapter 5 says, verse 7, He cried unto him who was able to save him from death and he was saved by the Father raising him up. Jesus was born of Mary and we find him being born of the Father bodily. Where we, and that birth is simply meant that he's giving eternal life to us as humans. So I want to say to you and to everybody that watches online, if this message can be radical, just go and pray about it. Just go and pray about it. Say, God, God, show me and just hear what the Father says. If I'm wrong, I don't want it to be believed, you know. But I know what this has done for me. I know the life it's brought to me. I know the hope it's brought to me in this world. It brought a great love for people. It brought a great love for creation. It brought a, a great love for myself. It brought a great love for every human because I see them as absolutely valuable. I see this physicality as created for the purpose of the kingdom of God and eternal life. It brought a love in me and it removed all anxious, wanting to know what's going wrong in the world. Remove it from me. And it brought in me a great joy of knowing what is right. And the things of this world grew strangely dim in the light of the glory of God in the face of a man. And that's what this gospel is all about. There's a birth for us of which the spirit of that birth you've already received and you can feel safe. Our spirits felt safe, but our bodies didn't feel so safe. But if we see this complete birth, as we see in Jesus, we find a complete safety, and we are then the bearers of hope, bringing life and hope to a dying world. Amen. Amen. And that is my message. <laughs> Amen. Thank you very, very much.